Hello everybody, welcome to today's research rundown. Uh, before we get started, I do have a couple of quick announcements that I want to make. Uh, first of all, we have another great virtual program later this week on Wednesday, and it's called Women at Work. It'll be at noon. And then we will also have uh, another one of our Food for Thought programs next Thursday, February 17th at noon. It is also going to be virtual. And Miss Karen Gray Houston will present stories from a daughter of the boycott. So we hope that you will join us for those programs. And uh, real quick, before we jump in, um, we're going to go possibly a little bit long today because we have a lot of great information to cover. And so I wanted to mention, if you are not able to stay for the entire presentation, that's fine. You can duck out if you need to, and we will be recording this session and posting it to our YouTube channel. It might take a couple days for it to show up there, um, but you're welcome to come back to the video wherever you had to duck out. You can come back to where you were and um, continue on with the rest of the presentation on YouTube. So we will have it on demand, um, just like all of our other virtual presentations. Uh, so if you have any questions, we're, we will try to leave some time at the end to take a couple questions. You can drop those in the comments. And uh, with that, I think we will go ahead and get started with the presentation. So uh, this research rundown is going to be about African American military records in Alabama, how you can research those if you have an ancestor who served. And my name is Courtney Pinkard. I'm the reference coordinator at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. So African Americans have participated in every U.S. military conflict since the American Revolution. And here at ADAH, we have documentation of that participation starting with the Civil War and going forward to subsequent conflicts. The U.S. Army was officially segregated until 1948 with African American soldiers usually serving in separate all-Black regiments from the Civil War up to World War II. Now, if we're going to start with the Civil War, we need to think about what documentation might exist to prove the service of an ancestor that was living during that period. In Alabama, African American men contributed to the Confederate war effort either as impressed manual labor on loan from their enslavers to the Confederate government, or they acted as camp slaves who were brought to the front by individual enslavers. With the exception of the last two weeks of the war, African American men, whether they were enslaved or free, were barred from enlisting in the Confederate Army as soldiers. On March 23, 1865, in a last ditch effort to add desperately needed manpower to their depleted forces, the Confederate government did pass an act that would have allowed enslaved men to enlist with their enslavers' permission. The war ended just 16 days later on April 9, 1865, with no wide-scale implementation of the act. In the course of my research for this presentation, I did stumble onto a really interesting exchange. This letter was written by a Mr. J.C. Bowie, and he's asking for permission for a pension, sorry, to be granted to D Mr. Edgar Roberson, who is a 112 year old man who was formerly enslaved in Talladega County. Now note that the letter says that Roberson served as cook and aide rather than in the battle line, which is an accurate description of how most enslaved men would have participated in the conflict. Although some former Confederate states did eventually expand their pension programs to include formerly enslaved men, Alabama was not one of those states. And here we see the State Pension Committee's response to Mr. Bowie's request. The second paragraph unequivocally states that although he, Mr. Roberson, did go to the Army with his master. No Negroes were enlisted and our pension laws do not grant to those men who served as cooks or body servants any relief. 
who since enslaved men and free men of color were not allowed to serve in the Confederate Army as enlisted soldiers, official records of their involvement are scarce. And because the state's pension system did not expand to include camp slaves after the war, this avenue of research that's often available to those researching white ancestors is also closed off. Now in the North, free African-American men were allowed to enlist, and in fact, by the end of the war, the Union had 175 African-American regiments, which made up approximately 10% of their total forces. If you're interested in researching an ancestor who might have served on the Union side, you should be able to use fold3.com and collections at the National Archives. Turning back to Alabama and the Confederacy, though, let's take a look at our Civil War Service database available on the Archives website. Back in the early days of our agency, archivists scoured our collections in an effort to document all Alabamians that participated in the Civil War. Each time they found a name on a record, they made an index card to record the information. Eventually, the information contained on these index cards was converted into a searchable database. Now today, you can generate a full list of enslaved men who got an index card by typing the word slave into the last name box and don't put anything else in. So when we hit search, we're going to find a list of just 121 men out of the many thousands that would have contributed to the war effort. We're going to take a look at two examples from this list. Edmund, who is associated with a specific regiment and company, and Elbert, who is only identified by his enslaver's name. Edmund's virtual index card is on the left. He served as a camp musician for Company C of the 33rd Alabama, and this information was retrieved from a company muster roll dated January 17, 1861. So it was pretty early in the conflict. However, it would be difficult to say with certainty who this Edmund is because he has no last name identified in the record and he's not associated with a specific enslaver. He could have been brought to camp by any of the soldiers in Company C. Elbert's card, on the other hand, gives us a little bit more insight. Elbert was enslaved by C. Bingham and worked as a laborer at Fort Morgan. This information was taken from the quartermaster's pay document and that's why we have an enslaver's name in this case because the quartermaster needed to know who to send the payment to in exchange for Elbert's labor at Fort Morgan. In the decades after the Civil War, Alabama's state militia slowly transformed into what we now know as the Alabama National Guard. Beginning in the 1880s, the state militia included three all of African American battalions. The three battalions were the Gilmer's Rifles, which was based out of Mobile, the Magic City Guards, which were based out of Birmingham, and the Capital City Guards that were based out of Montgomery. Although the state government never supported these black battalions to the same level as their white counterparts, the new constitution adopted in 1901 allowed the state legislature to have direct control over the composition of the state militia and led to even more discrimination. By 1906, all three battalions of colored troops had been disbanded completely. The Alabama National Guard would remain segregated until the 1960s. Despite the brief existence of the African American battalions, our Adjutant General's collections actually contain many valuable records that document the service of the men who joined. There's a series of folders in the Adjutant General's administrative files labeled colored troops, and they contain records like officer oaths, muster rolls, financial records, discharges, officer correspondence, and applications to form other African American battalions from counties around the state. Let's take a quick look at some examples. This first slide shows the outside label of some of the earliest muster rolls I could find for each battalion. The Birmingham and Mobile rolls were taken just a day apart in 1883, 
and the Montgomery Roll is dated later because it was the last of the three to be created. Here we see um, the, an example of an officer's oath of office. This particular oath was signed by Dr. Cornelius Dorset, who became the surgeon of the Capitol City Guards in Montgomery. He was a trustee of Tuskegee University and a friend of Booker T. Washington. I copied this letter because I just really loved the letterhead at the top. It's in such a beautiful script. The print is very large and you can even see the Reconstruction Era state seal of the eagle holding a banner with the state's motto on the banner. And here we see with the inside of the muster rolls that we looked at the outside cover a couple slides ago. This is what the inside looks like. There's not a ton of information here, but in a few minutes, we're going to look at a different type of muster roll from the Spanish-American War that gets into a lot more detail about each soldier. And finally, we have these two letters from Tuscaloosa. The letter on the left is a petition to the Adjutant General for a commission to form an African-American militia company, and it includes the signatures of several prominent African-Americans from the area. The letter on the right is also addressed to the Adjutant General, and it was written by an officer of Tuscaloosa's white militia company, the Warrior Guards. The author of the letter reports that his men discussed the formation of a colored company at length, and they were adamantly opposed to the idea. In fact, they unanimously voted to disband their own company if an African-American company was raised. I think the tenor of this communication probably explains why there were only ever three all-black battalions created during this period. When the Spanish-American War began in 1898, the president requested volunteer, volunteers from Alabama, and the War Department specified that the soldiers should come from the Alabama National Guard. Governor Johnston formed the 3rd Alabama Volunteer Infantry Regiment, filling it with African-American enlisted men and installing white officers to command them. Although they never saw battle or were deployed for foreign service, the 3rd Alabama Volunteers remained activated longer than any other Alabama regiment during the Spanish-American conflict. Our Adjutant General's administrative files contain extremely detailed muster rolls for companies A through M of the regiment. Here's an example of the muster roll for Company A. It's a two-page document, so this is the, on the left side would be the first page, and on the right side would be the second page, and the rows go all the way across. Uh, at the very top, we see the names of the three white officers in charge of the company, and then from the first sergeant down, we have African-American soldiers listed. Not only do we get a physical description and age for each of the soldiers, we can also see their civilian occupation, their place of birth, a copy of their signature, their marital status, and also their next of kin. Now, moving on to the next major conflict, we're going to take a look at how to research African-American service in World War I. When the United States entered the conflict in 1917, our standing army was much too small to supply the millions of soldiers that were going to be needed. So the federal government instituted a draft and required all men between the ages of 21 and 31 to register. Despite being just 10% of the overall U.S. population, African Americans made up 13% of the draft. African-American enlisted men were primarily assigned to non-combative roles like unloading supplies at French ports, driving supply trucks, working in field hospitals, and other tasks that supported the troops on the front lines. The exceptions to this were men assigned to the 92nd and 93rd Infantry Divisions, which were the only all African-American combat divisions to fight in both World War I and World War II. Black Alabamians served in both support and combat divisions, and there were a few places that we can look uh, to find evidence of their service today. 
The first place that we want to check would be the World War I service records available on the ADAH website under our Digital Collections page. In 2018, the archives conducted a crowdsource transcription project to collect selected details from the cards. And thanks to their hard work, we now have a few different ways that we can search these records. You can select a county from the main page and then narrow your results by hometown to see all the soldiers that serve from your hometown, regardless of their race. You can search by race first using the term African American in the search box, and then you can narrow it by home county or hometown to see only the African American men who served from a particular place. And of course, if you're looking for a certain person, you can always search for them by their first and last name. To illustrate searching and narrowing results, here's a screenshot from the service records page. I've already selected Otago County since it's the first one in the list, and the top arrow is pointing to the search box. It's a little small on the screen and it can be easy to miss. It, on your screen, it'll be up in the top right corner. Um, and then the bottom left arrow is pointing to hometown, and you can see a list of some of the hometowns below it. So let's say you're looking for someone who lived in Vida, Alabama. You can click Vida and just see the cards for the 42 men who listed Vida as their uh, place of residence. Next, let's take a look at an example of what the cards look like. This is the service card for Jimmy James of Furman in Wilcox County. Mr. James was inducted at Camden on August 23rd, 1918, so he was drafted fairly late in the war. His date of birth is February 2nd, 1895, so he was 23 years old. He was assigned to Company I of the 59th Depot Brigade and then to Company D of the 411th Reserve Labor Battalion until his death. He died of pneumonia on December 2nd, 1918, and his father was the person that was notified. Because Jimmy passed away while he was still in the service, there's a possibility that he has another type of record in our system, a gold star file. The Gold Star database was created by the archives in an effort to document Alabamians who had been killed in the conflict. Archive staff identified deceased soldiers and then contacted their families for more biographical information. Some families didn't respond at all, and some sent letters and photographs and other records pertaining to their loved one, so the amount of material for each file will vary. Our Gold Star database is available on both its own separate page and under the digital collections. For my examples, I'm using a search that was done in the standalone database. I searched for Mr. James and found an entry for him. By clicking other info indicated by the arrow on the screen, I can see the documentation that was submitted by his family. Here's a photograph of Mr. James and under it, there's a link to a bio form. Now again, some soldiers may have even more links below their photo. They might have one or more letters attached. There might be newspaper clippings or additional photographs linked down here. Let's click on the bio form link. So this form was completed by Jimmy's father, Willis James. Just on this first page, we get the names of Jimmy's parents and grandparents. The form goes on to list his education, his occupation, his political and religious affiliations, his marital status, and then concludes with a description of his military service. From the form, we learn that Jimmy contracted the Spanish flu while at Camp Taylor, Kentucky, and that he was buried in Furman at Old Snow Hill Cemetery. There was one more record type that I wanted to mention before we move on from World War I, and it's something that I found while working with our Alabamians at War vertical file. In one of the folders, there is a list of African American soldiers from the city of Montgomery. Now that's a pretty limited geographical area, but if your relative lived in Montgomery at the time that they served in World War I, they may be included on this list. This is the top of the first page, and you can see that the soldiers are listed alphabetically by their last name. Then we get their home address in the city, their serial number, and all the organizations they served in. 
Just in this list, we see men who were assigned to support units like depot brigades and training battalions. But then we have Nathaniel Adams, who was assigned to Company M of the 366th Infantry, which was a combat regiment attached to the 92nd Division, one of the two all-black combat divisions. And if you want to know more about Nathaniel's service, well, now you know how to search for his service card. Of course, the next major conflict that we come to is the Second World War. After World War I, the U.S. military became more federalized and the state's role in documenting federal military service began to diminish. Starting with World War II, we have fewer documents related to federal military service that were being generated and preserved at the state government level. The U.S. military was integrated in 1948, so World War II is the last major conflict where black soldiers would serve in separate all-black regiments. As far as documentation of World War II service, ADAH holds a collection of DD Form 214 or DD-214s, which are discharge papers issued when a soldier separates from military service. Our DD-214s cover the years 1939 to 1975, so soldiers who enlisted in Alabama and left the military between 1939 and 1975 might have a copy of their DD-214 in our collection. This captures World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. As I was doing some research for an unrelated project, um, I stumbled onto another interesting record type that relates to World War II. In 1942, the U.S. Secretary of State directed probate judges of each county to mail absentee ballots to deployed uh, soldiers who requested them. The judges compiled lists of soldiers that requested the ballots and then submitted the lists to the Alabama Secretary of State's office. And now the archives holds these lists for each county in Alabama. This is an excerpt from the Atauga County absentee ballot list. It shows the soldier's name, serial number, where they were currently stationed, and their hometown. If you located a family member's name on one of these lists, we could then also check for a DD-214 that would give even more detail about their time in the service. Now, for later conflicts, starting with the Korean War and going forward, we have fewer government agency record types that document military service. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, we do have the DD-214s that cover military separations up to 1975, but due to privacy laws, only DD-214s issued before 1960 are considered public record. DD-214s for veterans that separated after 1960 can only be released directly to the veteran or to a funeral home if needed for military burial. This is a rolling restriction of 62 years. So next year, the cutoff will be 1961, and then the next year, it'll be 1962, and so on. If you're researching a relative's participation in a more recent conflict, you may also want to check the active military service reports available on our digital collections page. These are cards that were filled out by men who voluntarily enlisted in the military, meaning they were not drafted through the selective service. And the dates range from the 1940s up to the 1960s. For some reason, the cards seem to be heavily weighted towards Jefferson County, with almost 30% of the cards being tagged with that location. Some men have one card, some have as many as five or six. It's a really quirky collection and a little difficult to describe. You kind of have to take a look at it. And after that, we have a small number of folders for Korea and Vietnam in our Alabamians at War vertical file, and a handful of photographs sorted by conflict in our digital photograph and pictures collection. However, if you would like to get involved with helping us document the personal experiences of Alabama veterans of more recent conflicts, you can always contact our registrar's office. If you have a family member or friend who served and might be interested in donating some of their personal papers or other military-related belongings, we'd love to have a conversation with them about that. 
They can reach out to our registrar's office and speak to Haley or Mary Taylor at the numbers that are listed on this slide. And we can also uh, put an email address into the chat if you'd like to save that. All right, so we covered a lot of information. There was a lot to talk about on these slides today. Um, so I do wanna take a couple of questions before we sign off. Um, so if you have a question about any of the information that we've discussed, go ahead and drop it into the comments and we will um, we'll select a few of those to answer. Okay, we've got quite a few comments. <laughs> I must have done a really great job. <laughs> Oh, okay. So um, in the comments, Rebecca says uh, that she has her dad's letters from when he was in the Korean War. Um, that would be, you know, if if you were interested in donating those to our collections, that would be a really great insight. Um, I, you know, the Korean War is one of those conflicts that I think a lot of times kind of gets overlooked. Um, my husband's father was actually in the Korean War as well. Um, and, you know, it's it, it was a, a brief war, and um, I, I think a lot of people don't learn about it much in school. And so, you know, we would, we would love to have better documentation of Alabamians' experiences over, you know, in Korea. Um, Michelle asks, will this be available for viewing later? Yes, uh, our presentation today will be recorded and um, it will be available on both Facebook and YouTube. It'll be added to the YouTube channel. Um, that may be the easier way to locate it if you want to come back to it later. Um, it Sometimes it takes a couple days though for it to actually show up on the YouTube channel. Um, and so, you know, you might have to wait a couple days, but it will be there. Okay, so how do you get a copy of a DD-214? Um, okay, so DD-214s, uh, if they were issued for a soldier who left the military before 1960, you can actually just give us a call at the research room and give us the soldier's um, name and date of birth, and we can go check and see. Um, if, it's, if the soldier left the military after 1960, um, there's more rules about releasing those because um, after a certain point, they will have things like social security numbers on them um, and other you know, identifiable information. So um, if it's after 1960, we can only release it to the veteran themselves or to like a funeral home if there's... If they need military honors for a burial if it's like an emergency situation like that. But um, pre-1960 is going to cover World War II and Korea um, veterans. So if you have, you know, an ancestor that served in those two conflicts, definitely give us a call, give us their name and date of birth, and we can go check and see if we have a copy for you. Uh, was the Adjutant General of Alabama or the U.S. government that carried out the Spanish-American War order? So that the Adjutant General that I was referring to with those slides is the Adjutant General of Alabama. So he's actually in charge of what was the state militia and became the Alabama National Guard. We actually don't have any access to federal records here at the archives. So any collections that I referenced would be at the state level. So we would be talking about the Alabama Adjutant General's office. These are some really great questions. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, so Michael asks, do we keep records of rejections of pension requests made by African Americans or appeals? Um, that's a good question, Michael. I have not come across any any of those records, but I haven't also haven't sought them out um, because, you know, 
that wasn't really set up in our pension system to to recognize them. Um, we just have never really had a request to go try to find someone. And that, honestly, me stumbling across the letter that I did find, it was not in any kind of collection that had to do with pension applications. Um, it was in a, a vertical file folder that was just labeled, um, it was Civil War African Americans. So I found that by chance. Um, and, and that, you know, the vertical file is kind of a catch-all um, for items that don't necessarily belong to a larger collection. But, you know, the state did have a pension committee and we would have to kind of dig into what, what state agency was responsible for administering that. And then we could look in their administrative files to see if maybe they preserved any of those requests and rejections. Um, so that's a really interesting, that's an interesting um, project. And I will probably go work on that right after, <laughs> right after this presentation is done, because now I'm curious, um, because that, that would be something really interesting to find. I just don't know if, you know, if if it would have been preserved as a permanent record in our collections um, since they weren't processed like other pension requests would have been. Um, Michael also asks, can you view the vertical file? Sure, definitely. Yep, um, I can. I actually know the exact box number that it came out of. Um, so I'm happy to, you know, pull anything that we referenced today. Uh, if you want to come into the research room, it's open um, Tuesday through Saturday, 8.30 to 4.30. And we will be happy to make any of the collections that I mentioned in the presentation today available for you to look at. And, you know, we would we would definitely be happy to help you um, see if you can find any documentation of your ancestors' uh, military service. All right. So, OK, well, it, we didn't run as long as I thought I, we were going to today. I guess I may have talked a little bit fast. <laughs> um, but if if we've got any more questions, we'll go ahead and last call and then we'll wrap up. OK. All right. Well, seeing none. Uh, we will conclude for today. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. I hope that you got uh, something informative out of the presentation. It will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel if you need to refer back to something that we talked about at a later date. And we hope that you will come in and visit us in the research room and hopefully go through some of these collections for yourself and see if you can find any connections for your family. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day.